Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Bell the Bell with Bobby Blaze. This is episode 31. I am your host, Jeremy, the Professor Vilmer, and I must be amongst the internet wrestling community because I see nothing but hicks and hillbillies in that audience. Bobby, why don't you tell us what's going on here? <laughs> well, I guess, thanks for, <laughs> yes, our demographic, I guess, and that's my, um, I'm right there in the backyard of it, the Hicks and Hillbillies, because I'm out here in the Hicks, and there's a bunch of damn hillbillies and rednecks and et cetera. I don't want to get too political, but you know, here's the thing, man. A damn school from Kentucky started harassing a bunch of Native Americans at one of those marches today. And, oh, shit. Uh, yeah, it's a Northern Kentucky private Catholic school, and that was trending earlier, and I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this country, man, you know? But um, I'm not going to turn into some kind of a uh, political you know, type show, but it's just you mentioned Hillbillies and Hicks, and uh, here's a private white privileged school that's uh, down there harassing Native American. I think it took place in San Antonio and stuff, and it just doesn't speak well for wow. uh, our state. Mitch McConnell, hashtag where's Mitch? He's been a fuck lifetime, as far as I can remember back in high school, political person here in Kentucky, representative, and I think he's been missing for 30 fucking years because I can't tell you one thing he's done. And again, I'm not going to go on some big rant, but obviously I am because I got a mail rant I want to tell you about in just a second. <laughs> it's going to be a positive light. So anyway, that's what's going on over here in this part of the world or this neck of the woods around this great country of ours better than that you know i'm proud to be an american and, and proud to be on this podcast and be a part of it with you and i have to say this professor title that you've gotten you have earned it this week you have this topic this this episode 31 i'm gonna let you you know introduce what we're doing all that but here's the thing man you you have really come through you are the true professor man and i appreciate that that's not a title easily earned in my eyes but you are the professor and you've proven that this week with all the top 10 the way you come up this list is incredible and i appreciate it very very much and, uh anyway i'll shut up for a second because i do have that little mail thing i want to get out there so i'm going to address a couple things and then tell them what the topic's going to be and then we'll hit your mail rant for the week which yeah <laughs> it's not a big one <laughs> well but it may become a weekly segment the way things have been going here lately. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think it will. <laughs> hey, so um, I, I wanted to share this one. You know, we're we're still pushing to get a little more traffic going on on our Facebook, but I did get a message this week. He was talking about the top announcers and uh, Lord Athel Layton. Hello, what do we have here? Anytime the Sheik went for a weapon, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to read, this guy's name was Christopher, and he says, I know you guys realize just what an incredible performer the original Sheik was. Such a great character and an absolutely brilliant promoter of wrestling in Michigan. Lord Layton was great, and the Sheik versus Bobo, ah, the Sheik versus Bobo Brazil storyline never got old. Thanks for keeping my memories alive. Uh, Christopher, thank you for writing in. And, you know, guys, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're trying to do here is pro wrestling from when we loved it, from when we were young. It's, it's in the past now. A lot of these guys have passed away. A lot of these guys have moved on. And there are stories from this time period I want to make sure people remember. It's just like the guys our dads grew up watching, like they're forgotten almost now, except for a handful of them, like Gorgeous George, a handful of the guys that were really big stars. But, you know, pro wrestling is in a really weird spot for the last 20 years, and I, I kind of see me and Bobby as people trying to keep certain parts of its history alive and not let the Vince McMahons of the world sweep it under the rug. So that's what I wanted to address real quick. Well, very well said. Thank you, Christopher. That's that's really just a straight shoot, guys. Um, we're, we're fans. I have to be a part of the business at, at some point in my life, um, and and we would we are really just trying to keep that history alive, man. And I think we're doing a pretty damn good job of it. We get a good, lot of good feedback, and right there is a testimony to that. So I don't have any uh, big shout-outs or anything this week. Just uh, you know, keep following us on our uh, – I push the Twitter because that's my main social media. But you can follow Jeremy at the Geekish Cast. You can follow me at Bobby Play 744 and you can also follow our joint account, which Jeremy has done a tremendous job at, over 1,700 people. You can follow us on that on uh, Bell to Bell Blaze. I'm sorry, at Bell to Bell Blaze. And with that said, I'm just going to go off real quickly here about uh, the fan mail again. 
I'm back on the radar, apparently. I've been getting some, but the people are getting smarter, and I appreciate it. I know it's not an insult to our fans because these are not people that listen to the podcast, apparently. They got my name off of some celebrity biz and who knows what. And this week I got one from Pennsylvania, and I'm looking at it, and it has, uh, looks like computer generated stamp. It has like Ronda Rousey on it, maybe. And then it has this gentleman's address. They have my address typed out really nice and neat. Uh, they even put tape over that. They put tape over the back, and inside of it was a really, really nice letter. Basically, just copied and pasted a bunch of shit they took off of either Wikipedia, off of tweets, or off of Facebook, or whatever. But they twi- they did it to where it looked like it was le- they put some effort into it, at least. Yeah. But more importantly, they sent a very nice picture they took whether they got it off the internet or purchased it at a show somewhere in the past or whatever, I do not know, but they actually sent that. And more important than that, they sent a fucking self-addressed stamped envelope. So that's really, really good. So that's the key to uh, anyone who's listening to the podcast. I think they know the rules for my fucking mail. I am appreciative of fans. I'm a fan myself. I never was an autograph seeker, but hey, if that's your thing, man, I'll never charge my autograph, but I cannot a fucking afford to, you know, send out free pictures to every person, especially when I'm paying the postage and all this. So with that said, I get another letter, and I'm thinking, okay, another fan mail, and here we go. And so this letter had about four stamps on it that had, like, uh, love magic. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is this, man? Where? And I look at this from Nevada, and it's a long-lost relative. And I read it's about a six-page letter. Jeez. Yeah. Typed up. It's about a 14 or a 16 font, maybe. All capital letters. And there's a lot of history, and it's about a great aunt of mine that I that I haven't seen for quite a while he mentions in this letter that she's now 82 this gentleman wrote me he is 74 years old and I'm going to call him over the weekend I'm waiting to my brother's going to read the letter as well so out of nowhere I get this uh, letter from a 74 year old that said he recently got online, um, recently found a podcast, uh, had remembered there was a, a wrestler in the family some way, had a t- way too much information to not be legit, and uh, couldn't have got it just from Pin Me, Pay Me, which he said he sent me several books that he really enjoyed. The man's obviously educated. He was talking about going across the country in 1945 with his mother from uh out in California, all the way to Washington, D.C. It was really, really interesting. For a little bit of family history, it wasn't directly at me as far as as my uh, family is concerned, but it did have something to do with my uh, – he missed a couple spots, but to tie it all in, it just never knows – Who's listening to the podcast and who, you know, who someone found us better yet. It was someone not looking for something. You know, they wasn't looking for autograph. They wasn't looking for money that I don't have. <laughs> it wasn't a bill collector. And uh, the thing is with this 74 year old, you know, hell, maybe, uh, Maybe he has something to leave me if I befriend him. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but no, it was good that our podcast is reaching people that you know. Hey, they just heard that you know had a wrestler relationship some somewhere in the family, and uh, they took the time to seek that out and fill me in on some things. And and it wasn't anything I really didn't know. It was just stuff that I was like, this person has to be a member, a distant member of my family, and uh, that's pretty cool too. Especially if we get a listener at seventy four years old, man. Um, uh, hell, that's great. And so, you know, I call them fans, and I think you're calling them fans now, too, and we appreciate that. So I appreciate that kind of fan mail especially. So uh, if you do write, uh, you know, um, at least be courteous enough to send a self-addressed stamped envelope and have your own picture ready to be autographed. I don't know who the fuck would want mine, but that's all right if you do because I'll send it to you. But um, anyway, that that's my mail rant. It's all good this week. Uh at least people are smartening up to it, I guess. And uh, the ones that are writing me, they aren't asking for anything free, at least. So, so uh, just to follow up on that, I saw on my Facebook where a friend of my mom's wrote, you know, oh, if your kids write to a Disney character, they'll get a signed, you know, photograph or something back. And I, I just put it at the bottom. I said, look, as somebody who has friends in, in these businesses where these where people look for autographs, 
always send a self-addressed stamped envelope when you are looking for <laughs> an autograph. <laughs> Way to smart them up. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, no big harsh mail rant, nothing, no, you know, nothing crazy to this week. I told you earlier before we went on uh, live here uh, or to record, you sound really good. Oh, thank uh, you. The professor, uh, man, that's a good good name for you. And with that said, this is uh, the Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze podcast. It's episode 31. It's the top. 10 Reasons We Hate Tully Blanchard. Oh. And man, Professor, you came through. You came through with that title, and you came through with some good reasons to hate Tully Blanchard. With all due respect, do I say that. So with that said, how about we start the podcast with number 10? Oh, well, <laughs> number 10. A good reason to hate Tully Blanchard is, <laughs> is he has cooler friends than you do. Yes, yeah. I don't care who the fuck you are. Tully Blanchard has way cooler friends than I do, or you do, or anyone else does. Yeah, it, it, name it's a, a few of them. Well, it's, <laughs> let's see. He was in a tag team with Gino Hernandez. He was one of the Four Horsemen. J.J. Dillon was his manager, and when he wasn't in the Four Horsemen, he was Arn Anderson's tag team partner. <laughs> Yeah. It's just, you know, fuck, the guy already hangs out with cooler people, dry, you know, just everything about his life is better than ours, and then he throws this on top of it. There you go. Uh, and, and hopefully by now everyone's caught on, we're saying well, 10 reasons you hate Tully Blanchard, you see where this one go, man. I mean, uh, we're not trying to promote hate, we, we don't shit on anyone, but here's the thing, man. How can you have fucking cooler friends than those guys? You don't. I mean, for fuck's sake, you're hanging out the fucking four horsemen. Uh, man, and, and I know you, uh, tag team champions with Arn Anderson, which go, we'll go into that a little bit more later in detail. But I'm also, you, you're a big fan of, uh, we've talked about it before, man. We're both fans of, but you more so, I think, uh, when he was, uh, the Gino Hernandez deal, man. Yeah. That's two tough little sawed off pastor. <laughs> Whatever, but they're cool. Yeah, it's just and they're just <laughs> you cool. For the heels fans, if you're just if you're just joining us, Jeremy and, and myself always cheered for the heels. By the way, just so you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's if, if if you're new listener, you, you need to understand something. We still call it wrestling, and we always cheer for the heels. There you go. Yeah, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's a big part of our shows right there. I I mean, any of our long term listeners know that I am every list I can. I put Tolly Blanchard on it. <laughs> You know, and uh, Gino Hernandez. I, I mean, I know we ran into a couple problems when we were putting him in our top heels list, where people thought we put him too low. Uh, but I think the world of Gino is a fucking heel. I love yeah. shitty, arrogant. Look, being a real heel is a lost art form. Tolly yeah. and Gino and Arn and Oli and, and Flair knew how to be a heel. Yes. And and Tully had a way of doing it just even a little bit more than the other guys. You know, where Arn and Ole just like you thought you thought they were just gonna whip the shit out of you. And you thought Flair was gonna nail your old lady. I don't know, you <laughs> thought like you thought like Tully was gonna key your car or something. You know, you just fucking hated the guy. I don't know. I think it's like yes, it's gonna take us number nine. I'm gonna throw it in there. Mm -hmm. He was a shit talking machine that would probably key your car and he'd probably fuck your old woman before Flair got to her. Yeah. That's the kind of heel he was. He was just a, a sawed off shit talking machine that that like I said, man, he was the one that, that you just knew, man. This guy you just there's something about him, the arrogance of it all, man. He wasn't just yeah, you could talk about Oli and Arn, you knew they was going you it, no question they're gonna whip your ass yep you know uh there's no question flair's probably gonna nail your old lady if he comes to your town but here's what you said like tolly he's probably gonna go out there and do it all he's gonna he just crashed the fucking car key and he's gonna sneak behind the other horseman's back <laughs> and yours and screw your old lady i told you the story about being at the olive garden yep. with this girl named lisa that was hot man that's on our youtube page you can find a youtube page at tinyurl.com b B, B, B video and look that one up where we're talking about him and I was sitting in an Olive Garden and WWE, or excuse me, NWA had been in down that evening and here comes Tolly with some chick and he was like when he walked into it uh, the restaurant, I mean, this bitch, I was with, she ready to drop her panties right there on the floor. And he already had a girl with him. And I'm like, oh, you fucking cock 
stocky, arrogant little, <laughs> and I can see it. And I was, I, I was bigger, stronger looking than him at the time. I'll say that because I was younger and more vital. But, uh, but hell, he'd have wiped my ass all over the parking lot when the truth came out. So I would still put him over. I sit there and ate my fucking uh, generic uh, <laughs> Italian meal off my girl, you know. But yep. uh, he had that arrogance about him. And uh, he didn't do any shit talk. He's sitting there just flirting with the girl that he's with, you know. And uh, but if he, if it would have started, I would imagine. Uh, like I said, I would went over and hung up his coat when he walked in, and <laughs> went out and got my fucking went out and gave my girl went out and got my fucking scratched up keyed car and say, "Well, that's a fucking triple loss tonight. Go home." Yep. You know, it's here. over. So here, Mister uh, Blanchard, here are the keys to my car. May I hold your jacket? Yes, uh, I'd probably at least say, "Can I watch?" Well, but yeah. no. <laughs> But yeah, he has number ten of way cooler friends. He's a shit talking machine, man. So what other reason well, do know, we I, need? To- I, I want to stick the shit talking machine for okay. a second because <laughs> I think Tolly used to strike the perfect balance, man. He'd point his finger and he'd get a, you know he'd get a little heated. And he'd slap the top of the table when he was talking, and even when he was shit talking the other guy, say he was shitting on Dusty Rhodes or Ricky Steamboat or 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 Magnum or whoever, he never made him sound like a pussy. He just made them sound like they weren't as good as him. You yeah, know, that's he, the art. Of, there's yeah. an art right there of. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh but no, 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 big, no. Big in pro wrestling, there's an art to if you go out there and just bad mouth and browbeat your opponent and you win, you've beat no one. But there's an art to those interviews and the promos. Well, an interview is different than a promo, and I've talked about that in my books. But in a promo, and I'm out there and Tully is doing his promo, he's not burying his opponent. You know, he's still keeping him strong, but he's keeping himself even stronger. Yeah. And that's the key right there. He's getting your, you don't, you don't have to bury the opponent to get yourself over. He put them over, but he still got over by making himself better than them. So that's very well worded. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. It's, he was, he was great at the shit talking because he could keep his opponent strong. And, and then the other thing I loved about his shit talk, Bobby, was he would barely come out of the match the winner. Barely the winner. Yeah. And then turn around and just like, I'm the greatest. Yeah. <laughs> you saw me whoop everybody's ass. You, oh, don't worry about what happened last week. That was a fluke. I, I could beat that guy any day of the week now. It's you know, just the way he would come out of that. Like he had just barely come out the winner, but he talked like he was, uh, had the upper hand the whole time. And even that was something that you would, as a fan, of the of the face in that match, you got even more frustrated because you realized, like, what a lion sack of shit. He wasn't yeah. winning. He just barely got through it. So for me, Tully is the perfect heel talker because he did everything that pushed all your fucking buttons the whole way through. The pre-match yeah. interview, the chicken shit wrestling style, and then coming out in the shit talk afterwards when you know he barely got past Magnum that time. Man, that's very well said. That's a reason right there to hate him. Hell, I'm surprised there's eight more reasons to hate this guy already. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it, man. Yeah. That's it. Wow. Uh, wow. Well worded, Professor. Damn. Uh, let's go on to number eight. Yes, sir. The TV championship feud with uh, him and Dusty Rhodes and also uh, Steamboat feud you mentioned to me. Uh, something I'll let you take over from there because I was, uh, wasn't aware of this, uh, what you meant when you sent me some messages. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. And well, just so, kind of tell the fans, uh, smart us up a little bit about this. Well, okay, so just real quick, when uh, Blanchard jumped from uh, Southwest Championship to uh, Crockett, I believe, or did he start with Crockett or did he start with uh, Georgia? It doesn't matter. Yeah, there but, you go. Um, he was he feuded with Ricky Steamboat for the TV title. And then when Ricky jumped from, uh, from the NWA to the WWF, they switched Blanchard to feud with Dusty for the TV title. And it was around this time that they introduced that boilerplate red belt, the silver plates with red uh, red paint and red yeah. leather. And there's a, I have kind of a rule about championship belts. Uh, I think red leather belts look like shit, except for that TV title, which looked fucking amazing. So Tully Blanchard not even got to feud with two of the greatest wrestlers of all time for the TV title. He got the coolest looking TV title belt of all time as well. Yeah, I had to go and look at that belt. It, it was it really was a good fit with the red and the boiler plate. You know, the yep. whole that one actually looked good. 
And that's that TV champ. That's one of those things where some guys just look at that like, ah, fuck, that's just something I got to carry around now or whatever. Yep. But no, when you're when you're the TV champ, and that's when that's when we're talking when you know being the TV champ meant something because you had to be on TV every week. Yes. And you had to go out there and defend your title and show up at those TV tapings in addition to all the house shows and, and do your do your loops. And so that just shows how tough he was as a performer too because he's he's carrying that on. And like you said, he went out with a few with Steamboat, who was I was thinking about this the other day. We did that greatest baby fist baby face list, and you know Steamboat's probably the only guy uh, unless someone can come up with another one he's probably like got never ever turn heel in pro wrestling i don't know if we talked about during that, oh. that uh podcast but i do i was just having that middle i can't remember who brought it up but someone did and and i was walking around and in my head i was thinking you know what and this has been a few months back and then it come up the other day uh steamboat stayed face the whole time and so the, he took off then you got one of the biggest stars Ever in Dusty Roads, you know, and he's booking the shit, and and they're down there, and you you said the whole jump from I think Southwest. We I let you kind of fill us in on a little bit about why we didn't include some of those titles on this as this list goes on. But you're feuding for that TV title against the Booker, and you're going to you know with uh, this beautiful title, and you're the TV champ every week, week in and week out, and you're going from town to town, and you're defending that, you're defending tag team champions, eventually you're, you're, you're doing everything. So he steps in from one promotion to another, and it steps into a prime spot on na- on a national level. So yeah. uh, he had a little bit of national exposure, and, and we're reading about that a little bit in uh, Death of the Territories right now, how some of this is taking place. But fill us in if you want from uh, – to the Dusty Feud, which we just talked about for the TV championship, but also a little bit of back to Southwest as to why we're not including those um, well, feuds yeah. on here. So, I mean, um, when he was with uh, Southwest Championship, he was six-time tag team champion, and I think he held the singles title a couple of times as well. But, like, somebody asked Macho Man one time, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know he asked him... Um, you know, why are you the champ? And Mach said, because my dad owns the company. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's, so that's why we have trouble putting those titles with Tolly. When uh, Joe Blanchard ran Southwest Championship, it's hard to it's hard to separate talent from relationship when you're that close to the owner. So yeah, that's you know, what I was trying to get out of you. Yeah, but in that situation, in both of those situations, it was proven those guys were worthy of those titles even though their, their fathers owned the promotions, when they jumped to bigger promotions, yes. they were proven talents. They worked their ass off, even though they could have, you know, got by on, oh, hey, my dad is the promoter or my dad owns a company or whatever. No, they took pride in a pro wrestling business, and they took pride in their work. And and, and Tully took pride in being that little heel prick uh, that got over wherever he went and was a champion wherever he went. And that was just another reason to fucking hate him, man, because there he is, especially, excuse me, I hit my desk here. Yep. Uh, if you was a big fan of uh, uh, and I don't know why you wouldn't be a big fan of we mentioned too uh, Ricky Steamboat or uh, Dusty uh, we got our whole special episode number four on a belt and belt Bobby Blaze on Dusty Rhodes why you wouldn't be a fan of those guys but but Tully Blanchard, you know, here he is, the TV champion, having runs with those guys. And that just makes them, especially when you cheer for those baby faces, like I said, why wouldn't you cheer for Dusty, um, make you want to hate Tully that much more? Of course, Jeremy and I were back in the back, and we're laughing and snickering when I have fucking Tully got him again, that little heel prick. <laughs> <laughs> we got over. Or we could say, you know, oh, the bad guy won. That was us before the terms of heels. Now that got out into the national spotlight and – Cafe was broke and everything, but I'm sure Jeremy was much like that, like I was with my buddies going, ha ha, the bad guys won. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, let's hope we go on to number eight or number seven. I'm well, sorry. And, and we'll do that, but I also, uh, we, you were talking real quick about the TV champ back then. They had to be on yeah. TV every week to defend the title. Right. Uh, when the TV titles were introduced, what we, most companies had a rule that they had to be defended every week in a 10 minute time limit. And, you know, that was, that was the, no matter what, if you were TV champ, you were on TV every week defending the title and you had 10 minutes to do it. And beating a guy in 10 minutes can make a dude look fucking super tough, especially in the old days of the NWA when matches were still longer than four minutes. Yeah. 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 
Um, I mean, it wouldn't matter much now in the WWE where you talk for 48 minutes and then wrestle for three, but (laughs) yeah. So yeah, but that go ahead. I was going to say, but that being said, let's go ahead and jump up to number seven. Yes. The championship, the United States heavyweight championship matches he had against Magnum TA, the big feud he had with uh, Magnum TA. Yeah. Uh, so when he was feuding with Magnum, Magnum was on his way to being the biggest star in the NWA. And we've said it a million times on this show, a hero is only as good as his villain. Yes. So if Magnum was the biggest star, what's that make Tully? <laughs> yeah, the biggest villain. The biggest villain. And uh, that was a hell of a feud, the two of those guys going at it. And Magnum was a big guy. I mean, you know, you've heard people even say that he was going to be the Southern Hulk Hogan. Yeah. So he was a big man, and he he cut a rather large and imposing figure. And then Tully was like this little sawed-off Wolverine runt who was still slapping the shit out of Magnum as often as he got the shit slapped out of him. Yeah. Yeah, he was a uh, – Magnum was a big, big man, had that great look to him, big, strong physique. Uh, good interview, tremendous wrestler, uh, amateur and professional. And here in Tully, that's the thing about him, amateur background, quarterback, West Texas State, uh, mm-hmm. wrestler, you know, again, come from a territorial system. Uh, and again, we're still talking territory at this point, but still just knows how to get over, work with this younger talent that he can, that he can work with and, and see that, you know, this is, this is what we're doing. We're going to fucking make money. We're putting asses in seats. People want to see this. You got this big, good looking, you know, the whole Magnum PI to Tom Selleck. You got the Magnum TA, this good looking guy just, and, and Tully's out there just fucking pushing every button, being that little sawed off rut, heel prick, like we talked about, man. And people are getting in those seats to see that feud take place. And that's what it takes because you got an antagonist and you got a protagonist. And, you know, you got that little fucking guy that's pushing your buttons once again. And again, uh, I don't speak, I don't think I'm speaking out of school when we say, if you didn't like Magnum TA, I don't know what your fucking problem was because you could cheer for the heels all you want like Jeremy and I did, but by God, you have to have someone to fight with, and that's the baby face. And what a fucking baby face Magnum was, and how over was Magnum. Everyone saw his fucking talent and knew the guy was a tremendous athlete and wrestler. And I love that combination. I've mentioned it before. When someone comes from a very athletic background and also is a wrestler and gets into the world of professional wrestling, it's just unreal real uh, what they can do in that ring and those guys were doing some tremendous tremendous stuff uh, in their program man and, and it's just uh, it's, and they drew money that's yeah. the whole idea it's the wrestling business it's the pro wrestling business so uh, they drew money with that well and here's the thing back in the olden days you know when, when the four horsemen were hot when they were really hot there were no guaranteed contracts you got paid based on how many asses you got into that building that's where the money came yeah. from. You got paid from the house, yep. off the house. And the four guys and the horsemen, totally is is no exception shit. He may be at the top of the list. He could get people to pay to come see him get his ass kicked. Yeah. That was his job. That's what he yeah. was good at. And even and though we love to hate him, we still wanted to see, get his, see him get his ass kicked, even though we secretly cheered. Every that's time right. You got the upper hand. <laughs> that's right, and that, that's one of the things is is not only could Tully talk him, they said call, you know talking him into the building. He would talk you into the building, you know, doing the pre interview, pre match interview, mm-hmm. uh, getting that win, uh, and barely getting by on that win, like you said, that psychology during the match. And then afterwards, that promo he may cut afterwards of, you know, hey, you saw how much, and then he, you're just like, oh man, I just. Oh, I just want to see him get his ass kicked, you know. And um, and he had uh, he had some good feuds with some good people, man. We already mentioned Dusty Steamboat, fucking Magnum TA, and he had that national championship title. And um, I think that's going to take us to number six, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, okay, so the, he carried. There was a point there where in the Horseman, Ric Flair was world champion, Arn was TV champ, and Tolly was national champ. Um. The national title was one that used to confuse me, and Bobby, you dug up some info on it, but I didn't know where that belt came from, but it was one of those titles that when it showed up suddenly out of nowhere, I was like, fuck, man, the NWA is huge. They have even more titles I've never heard of out there. Yep. 
And uh, mm-hmm. go ahead. Sorry, well, I that cut you off. Also, I like the design of the national title because it was actually the same plate as the TV title, which was actually the same plate as the, I believe, 1985 WWF world title. Okay, cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. But go ahead. No, I was just going to say, what happened was, uh, when, when you sent me that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty cool title. Uh, let me just check something out. A lot of times, you know, you can fact check us, and that's fine. But what I did is I went in, and, and the professor here, he sent me some info, and I was like, oh, man, thank goodness, Jeremy, come through this time. But, yeah, what happened was the NWA, you know, was all over the United States. So in 1975, they established, uh, especially in the Mid-Atlantic Territories, uh, I think it said more specifically Jim Crocker Promotions. The NWA didn't recognize a sole champion due to every region having their own United States title. And with that said, they came up with, apparently in 75, the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship. So that's what they had there in the Mid-Atlantic Territories, and that's the belt that Tully had that was going back and forth. Now, with that said, I don't want to get too far off track as to why I hate Tully because he was the national, or the, excuse me, the NWA United States Heavyweight Champion. That eventually morphed, uh, when WCW bought him, it morphed into a belt, and eventually, I think, Jeremy, just word that how we talked about off the air there, how that morphed into so, where it went to. So it looked like, and I think you're right, when But WWF, that's where it came from, around yeah. 75. So. When when the WWF bought or acquired or, or merged with Georgia Championship Wrestling, however you want to refer to that, it appears they inherited the national title, and then eventually they uh, unified it with the Intercontinental title. As far as we can tell. Um, Somewhere when WCW bought Crockett Promotions, that title came. Of course, not not, not the, the belt design changed, obviously, yep. 30 years ago, so bear with us on that. But, yeah, somewhere between NWA and 75, having it, the belt that Tully carried around. And when in 88, I guess, when the sale went through and WCW was purchased, that title came with it, and they kept it around for a while. And then eventually, with the buyout and, and everything, they eventually kept it, but different titles, but still the U.S. heavyweight title. And it morphed into they did a tournament, and then it, it became the Intercont. They put it in under the Intercontinental Championship Wrestling. I, what is that? The Intercontinental Championship belt now, I guess. Yeah. They carry around. So somewhere they incorporated that belt into that. But uh, we're hell, we're jumping way ahead on that part of it because we we just basically was talking about him being the United States Heavyweight Champion for the Mid Atlantic and uh, more specifically Jim Crocker Promotions. Uh, he was recognized as United States Champion and had a hell of a belt to back up uh, that fact. Yep. That and and now just 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 because we already jumped to the future, the NWA yeah. re released a national title at the end of 2018. Yep. But to add more confusion to the to the matter, they made it look like the old U.S. title. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I'm all confused. I, I don't yeah. know what's what. Anymore. It's worse than a soap opera. But the good thing about a soap opera is you can miss for a week or two weeks or a year. You can come back and still pick up on it. That's because so. <laughs> nothing ever really happens. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, let's do this. Let me give a quick rundown before we go into our top five of the top ten reasons why we hate Tully Blanchard. And that is number ten. I swear, once you get past this one, it's hard. I don't know where it takes kind of number nine there. But number ten, man, he had cooler friends than you and I. And I don't care who the fuck you are. Tully Blanchard had cooler friends. <laughs> number nine, he was a shit-talking machine. And number eight, he was he had that TV championship uh, belt. Uh, it was the first, the red one that really, really looked good on the red leather, rather. And he had a few with Steamboat and Dusty, some really good baby faces. That took us number seven, where he had that U.S. championship belt we were just now talking about, where he had a few with Magnum. Uh, so, you know, working with those kind of baby faces right there on top, showing you what kind of heel and another good reason why to hate uh, Tully was those reasons right there is because he was fighting all those baby faces. And that's going to take us to a quick little break here. I think there needs to be uh, – who's sponsoring our show this week, Jeremy? Well, uh, you know, we, Bobby, of course, as usual, every week our, our show is sponsored by Bobby's books that he has written, has available on Amazon. The first one is Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boots, Will Travel which you can get by going to tinyurl.com slash blazebook1. He also has his follow-up book, I Kicked It On To, The Education of a Wrestler, which is available at tinyurl.com slash blazebook2. But we're going to add something new in this week. We're going to try try to um, 
see if people out there who haven't gotten Amazon Prime might like to try a month out for free. And you can get to that. You get 30 days of Amazon Prime by going to tinyurl.com BB Try Prime. This will get you access to their streaming content, which includes the old Memphis wrestling stuff, uh, to one of my favorite shows called Corner Gas. Every season is now available on Amazon Prime. And it will get you free shipping for 30 days. Guys, this is a cannot lose, and you help the show with all of those. Yes. Um, try that. Yeah. I have Prime, and I found some really good shows on there. Uh, that stream, but also, man, it's it's worth it just in a free shipping. It's yeah, it's absolutely. worth it. It really is. It's it's just go to the um, go to the link that Jeremy try it thirty days free. Tinyurl dot com backslash or front slash I guess BB try Prime and uh, you know just look around thirty days and and cancel if you want to. But hell, get a couple books off there. Get my books. Get get uh, whatever the hell you read. Get go get some DVDs. Uh, enjoy some the old Memphis that they have on there, whatever you want to do. But you get the free shipping on those books or DVDs that you purchase or gifts. And hell, that's worth it. If someone's got a birthday coming up, uh, you know, you want to get them a present off of Amazon. Hell, you can get it probably shipped to you free and, and, and save you some money right there, if nothing else. But after 30 days, you'll probably end up liking it and sticking around. I know I have. I've had Prime for several years now. And yeah. I'm very, very happy with it. And uh, like I said, I found some good streaming shows that I like. And um, I like at East Bound and down. I watched that series when it was out, and um, I'm watching that uh, uh, the marvelous uh, Miss oh, Mizell. Right yeah. Now. Oh my God. Their Lenny, great. Their Lenny it, Bruce is outstanding. Yeah. Whoever that yes. is, he is great. I love him. Uh, looked his name up. I can't remember it now, but yeah, it's. Um, oh. I just looked it up the other day. But anyway, what a fucking series that is. I'm one. Uh, just about to finish season two. Uh, there's only two seasons on there, but I think I'm about halfway through it. I love that. It's just some good shit out there, man. And uh, like I said, you get some free shipping, so try it. Tinyurl.com slash BB Try Prime and uh, help the show out a little bit. We appreciate that. Yep, very and there, much. And there is one more book I wanted to throw out there this week for people who haven't read it because we are talking about Tolly Blanchard, one of the original horsemen. Uh, there is a book available on Amazon, uh, Four Horsemen, A Timeline History by Dick Bourne that you can get to by going to tinyurl.com slash bbhorseman. I believe it's only like 13 or 15 bucks. And J.J. Dillon said that this book reads like a journal of his time with the Four Horsemen. Nice. Yeah, nice. so it's definitely one to check out if you're interested in the Four Horsemen. Uh, and you know what I want to say real quick, Bobby? I haven't had this much fun thinking about or talking about or watching wrestling in almost 25 years. Uh, <laughs> I, I need to thank all of our fans and you and everything that's going on in the in the business of pro wrestling right now for making me excited and making right. me realize how much I love this sport, and I do call it a fucking sport again. Yep. I do too. And I, that's one thing. And everyone, you know, you can get the books. Uh, hell, you can write me and I'll send an autographed copy to you. Um, you know, those are for purchases. If I make personal appearances, which I'm going to try to go to the February show, uh, February 23rd show, I will go to talk to you a little bit about that later on. Um, when I autograph a book with my point, I always put in, I just sent one out to a guy named David the other day, school teacher, but I always put in, always remember the good times that pro wrestling brought to you, or I always put, always remember the good, always, always remember to have good memories of pro wrestling. And I'll hashtag it over pro wrestling. Um, I started recently putting hashtag BBBB in there yep. and put a link to our podcast. Uh, and it's not that I'm selling a shitload of books, but always what my point was is, is I thank them for being a fan because we're all fans, you know. Um, I had a couple guys come by and visit me that are in the business today last Friday and had a great, great visit with them. But, um, you know, but I hashtag it pro wrestling because we're fans and also that I put in there the great memories. And that show here has brought back so many great memories. Like we talked at top of the hour there with the letter from Christopher, you know, keeping that. We said that she could be on every fucking list, just like you said, Tully, which we'll get back to in just a second, could be on every fucking list. That's who you like, you know. So there's so many. Uh, just hit us up at hashtag BBBB at the Geekish Cast on Twitter or at Bobby Blaze uh, 744 on Twitter or best to do it on Bell to Bell Blaze hashtag BBB 
BB and let us know, you know, who you think or why you hated Tully or, you know, a subject, uh, a topic. We've done a greatest announcer here recently and also the, uh, the 10 most legitimate tough guys in the business and those podcasts are out there. And, uh, with that said, we're going to move on to number five, but man, just, just the excitement. That's what gets us going. That's why sometimes we, we just get too excited and almost to shut up and let you give us number five, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, thank you too. Yeah. Uh, the, so number five, we're going to go straight into for, for the tag team aspect of Tolly's career with Arn Anderson. And, uh, I, I want to talk for a second about how they stomped the shit out of Ricky Morton's face. Uh, God, I love Ricky. Punky, yeah. if you're listening. <laughs> they they beat him till he looked like the elephant man at the end of that match. Yeah. He had to wear he had to wear a face cast. Yeah. Poor Ricky. He can uh, put them ass to the seat especially those tinny boppers. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yeah. So, so um him and Arn were a great tag team. Um they were as good as Arn and Oli were. At least as good. At least, yes. Yeah. Uh, they, they could make a guy look like they were just having the shit whipped out of him the whole time. And I'll tell you what, if you wanted to see an audience go wild, wait until Arn and Tolly had been beating the shit out of Ricky and he got a tag to Robert. There you go. You talk about a hot tag. Yep. That's what it's known as in the wrestling business. And then when Ricky Morton over there selling, selling, selling the best teller in the history of professional wrestling, just got the shit beat out of him. And he's struggling, he's struggling, he's crawling, he's crawling, he's reaching for the audience, and he's drawing you in, he's drawing in, he's bleeding, and he reaches up and he finally touches Robert Gibson's hand, and boom, there's the hottest hot tag all of professional wrestling right there. So yep. The Rock and Roll Express against uh, Tully and Arn, man. What some great fucking matches. Yep. So, so, Tully and Arn were such a hot tag team that they decided to jump to the WWF. Yep, they sure did. Uh, back in about October of 88, they made their de- debut. They jumped from uh, Crockett Promotions over to the WWF. They became known as the Brain Busters because Bobby the Brain Heenan, who we both love very much, yep. <laughs> but they, uh, under under tutelage of Bobby the Brain Heenan now, they were no longer horsemen, although I'm sure there was chance in every building it went to, uh, and I'm sure people was showing the horseman sign, but they were known in WWF at the time as the Brain Busters because Bobby the Brain led them to a championship eventually. I think that took place. They were there. They started in October of 88. I think they got the straps in about July, if I'm not mistaken. I uh, think they beat Demolition. After a, they, they worked with the Rockers. I did see them live uh, with the Rockers. That was the year I broke in, by the way, in 88. But I saw them with the Rockers uh very early early on in a WWF at a house show. And, man, you know, they really helped that team out a whole lot. And and I think there's some footage out there of, the, of Marty and uh, Sean both talking about how, if nothing else, I know there's some of Arn talking about how he helped those uh, young tag team, the Rockers, out. But to get back more on track, in July, I think, of uh, 89, I guess it would be, they became the uh, WWF champions beating Demolition. And the way, and I'm gonna let Jeremy kind of do his transition here, but they weren't just announced as the um, the WWF champions; they were announced as the three times champions because two of those times were under the NWA banner, as we talked about just now. Have them having a feud with the Rock and Roll Express and several others. But Jeremy, tell us about that when WWF, how they see it when they announce now the Brain Busters three times. World Tag Team Champions. <laughs> yeah, it's a typical WWF. They, they will bring up history when it works in their favor. But, you know, if, if it was just like uh, referencing somebody's time in the NWA to make that person sound better, ah, shit on that. We don't need that kind of trouble around here. But if we can make you sound like a, a three-time world champion tag team for us, we're all over <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't have to mention NWA. Everyone knew, yeah. but it was convenient for WWF. And the good thing about that, though, I will say this. At least Arn Anderson kept the Arn Anderson name, and as we're talking about today, Tully Blanchard was still Tully Blanchard. Just they were tag team known as the yeah. Brain Bluffs. Well, they got and, to keep their name. So and that, that was, was rare game. at that time. Usually exactly. people coming into the WWF had to change their name, and they usually didn't even get a name. They were just the something. Right. Yeah. Right. 
So that's that 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 was a good thing. But yeah, it was convenient for them to be announced as you know three times champion. So it makes the company look even better. Yeah. So um, I don't know, but man, what a great tag team Tully and Arn were, and uh, tr- two tremendous performers like that and athletes like that. How could they not be? Especially uh, you know with all the talent they had to work with. Man, uh, you know we we just brought up the, uh, two of the best, Ricky and Robert, right there, and uh, I love those guys to this day. But back in the day, I told them so many times before. I used to cheer against them guys all the time because I wanted to see them get their ass beat. But I knew they was always going to fucking win because, you know, just throw it in there. I'm a Cornette guy, and I was a Midnight Express fan, yep. so we can just kind of throw it out there. We cheered for the heels. And, uh, but uh, I love Ricky Robert. I know that. But, um, yeah. but uh, you know, so that's just one of those things I want to put out there in well, the real, real world, just so you know. <laughs> well, real quick, while we're talking about tag teams, I want to say that at least in America – this this period of time here, whether we're talking WWE or NWA or even uh, you know UWF or where or AWA, this right, was probably yeah. the last time we had as many good tag teams. Yeah. And, and by tag teams, I don't mean where you just randomly stick two assholes together and now they're a tag yeah. team. I mean when you had guys that came into the business together to compete as a team. Yeah. This was probably the last period of time because the WWF had a lot of good tag teams in it at this time. The NWA, so you know the Rock and Roll, the Midnight, the Rockers yeah. had just come in. The uh, the Road Warriors were still out there. Right. This this was still a good time for tag team wrestling. And Bobby, I've always said if I were ever going to try to promote a wrestling show, what I would want to do is do a tag team tournament in California that did like the old school Japanese cup uh award winning at the end once a year and that's it. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Nice. So I love tag team wrestling and I am happier than shit to remember this period of time because there were still a number yeah. of great tag teams. Great tag teams. And I'm gonna tell you just a little bit something real quick. If I win the lottery tonight, mm-hmm. I will uh come out there to California and we'll promote this uh tag team tournament and do it that way. But I'm gonna tell you the quickest way to become a millionaire in professional wrestling. <laughs> you, you, you know how you know how that is, don't you, Jeremy? Uh, would you start off as a billionaire? Well, you close. I was going to start off as two million dollars yeah. because <laughs> you're going to lose your hat. So yeah, the quickest is no time. Quickest way to become a millionaire in professional wrestling: start off with two billion or two yeah. million rather. So yeah, so you was right on that. Very good. That's why you're the fucking professor. So, <laughs> we just we uh, guys, we just got an old joke book and we're trying out some new material here. Yeah. Okay. So with that said, let's go to number four, man. Number and, four. Uh, four. Woo! We've talked about her before, man. It was the perfect story angle, and we're bringing her up again, man. Yeah. Baby doll. Baby the doll. Perfect. 10 and, and, and if you're listening sweetheart we love you nothing but love and respect for you yes i know miss roberts has listened to us before so. yes, she has yeah and maybe we'll send her or someone will direct her to this episode and we just want to send our love out to her and say uh man it was great and uh she sent in her favorite dusty moments uh actually to us on youtube uh she sent us a link one time because yep. she does contact our page. I know she's contacted me a couple of times, and I appreciate that very much. With that said, real briefly, I'm going to say something here real quickly, Jeremy. I'm just going to uh, – she sent out a link to – uh, her favorite Dusty moment when we did that, that episode. If you use tinyurl.com slash BBBB video, that'll take you to the YouTube channel. And if she's listening or someone tells her, hey, them guys, we really put you over on a show this week, if she has a favorite Tully moment she wants to share it with us, please share it with us. We'd appreciate it. We'll try to get it up on the YouTube channel for you. Uh, it's probably already out there. Look it up. Let us know and hit us up, and that'd be great. But tell us about that feud, Jeremy. Well, Would you, you know, Let's let's just start a little bit with uh, Baby Doll's past because people may okay. not know it, but when most of us first saw her, she was Gino Hernandez's bodyguard under the name Andrea the Lady Giant. Mm. So she came in as what was supposed to be a badass chick, kind of you know you see them all the time like China was or like Camille Brickhouse is for Nick Aldis. She's the, you know, the, the rough and tumble bitch standing behind the badass dude who still needs a woman to be, guard him, you know. Mm. Now, there comes a point where Tolly's starting to get a little short of temper with Baby Doll, and uh, <laughs> Dusty Rhodes is starting to be a little more sympathetic to Baby Doll, and uh, Tolly being the little shitty bastard, and they would never do this now, but Tolly being the little shit eating bastard that he was, starts putting his hands on her right, violently. 
Yeah. And takes a She-Hulk, and this is, I like Texas wording here, so I'm going to use it exactly. And he takes an evil She-Hulk and turns her into <laughs> a sympathetic baby face with one move. There you go. Yep. Man. And that's putting asses in seats, man. Yep. And that gives you another reason, uh, one more reason to hate Tully Blanchard, man. Yep. You know, just the way he was treating Baby Doll. And the perfect 10, you know, that's just great, man. It's just, it's just good. It made not just if you was a wrestling fan watching it TV, it made it want you to get out to the arena and get to see the show. You know, you wanted to be there and see this stuff live, man. Uh, it was pro wrestling the way it's supposed to be, you know, and the way you liked and, uh, it. And that's it. And that's why you wanted to see Tully get his ass beat, man. So that's why another reason to hate him. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, so this, I mean, this set up all sorts of things. She ended up working yeah. for Dusty at the end of this. This is how Tolly went from being manager uh, associated with her to JJ Dillon, which is what led to the eventual accidental creation of the Four Horsemen. Right. Cause you uh, had what Blanchard Enterprises, I think, with, with, yep. uh, okay. Uh, I can't remember all the businesses they said he owned, but yeah, that right. was, he was like, uh, yeah, they were kind of, I don't know, was it more of a J.R. Ewing thing they were doing with him, kind of? <laughs> but they were kind of Maybe. doing doing like an evil corporate boss uh, kind of thing with him, with J.J. And uh, that's I mean, and the horsemen were formed when they just got up a bunch of different villains that were managed by J.J. And Arn Anderson accidentally spit out the term for a horseman. Yeah, well, they all had titles. Yep. And he just spit it out there, man. And there it was. And it's one of the greatest, if not the greatest of ever, of just, you know, right on the spot thinking, boom, or maybe the stream of unconscious thought, you know, and putting it out there. Yeah. And that, that sign, the four horsemen of the pop clips, boom, and that was it. And that took off, as we've spoken about before. Uh, wow. Anyway, we could go on forever about the horse, but that's not what this episode is about. It's just specific about Tully. Yep. So number three, the whole baby doll angle, which is what we just now spoke about the horseman. That's another reason I hate Tully Blanchard. Of course, we're being a little bit sardonic and sarcastic saying that because we love Tully as we love professional wrestling because we're just fans. Before we jump into number three, Jeremy, have the people go to tinyurl.com backslash BB try prime. Get that Amazon. On Prime, give it a try. For Thirty days, it doesn't cost you a dime. Give it a, after thirty days. You want to stay with him? You stay with him. If you don't, you don't. But it's one way to help Bell to Bell Bobby Blaze podcast out. And I just want to give that little cheap plug in there. And if you listen to the show, we don't do a whole lot of advertising. If someone does want to advertise with us, that'd be great. We are looking for some advertisers to offset our our hosting fees. But we appreciate that very much because every little thing does help the show. But also, I guess it is uh, what I'm giving you today is a uh, more cheap plugs than an anal plug i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but i want to jump to number three real quickly because we talk about blanchard enterprises and just the thing that you brought up and i'm gonna let you take over it because this is your wording and i don't want to take away from your wording but man he dressed better than you did you know so yep he bet he was better dressed than i was at the olive garden let's start with that <laughs> yeah he was he was uh you know totally totally blanchard dressed better than you but he still looked like a used car salesman, but the only people thought that had no class anyways. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> like myself with his best girl at the Olive Garden sitting there in blue jeans and a T-shirt and tennis shoes. Um, yeah, I, I was over. You know, you know it, what's funny is Tolly would go from rocking like a nice-looking tux to some Herb Tarlick WKRP in Cincinnati-looking <laughs> plaid suit. I, I never knew if they were trying to make him look good and it just slipped up occasionally or if they were trying to make him dress dress down. I could never fucking figure it out. But he was like a, an angry Herb Tarlick. That's that's what we got there. Damn. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take us to number two. <laughs> I'm getting stuck my mind back somewhere else on that suit and stuff because I know how he walked into the Olive Garden. I'll yep, just sit yep. there and be redundant on that story. But one thing, when I saw this list by the professor here, man, I had totally forgotten about 
And when I saw this number two, I popped big time because, you know, being a performer or a professional wrestler myself, I used to love this and I didn't know how in the world. And, and it, even in the business, once I got in it, it's still tremendous was the slingshot suplex. The way he executed that finish, man, I don't care what size you were. It was hard to maneuver, get this maneuver and his finishing hold on someone. And he done it on some very big guys and he made it look so fucking impressive and one thing about back in the day when you had a finishing move no one was to ever kick out of it no one else on the show right. could use it and no one kicked out of your finish and the slingshot suplex was a thing of beauty and you can look that up on YouTube and see what we're talking about. But, man, it was just a tremendous, tremendous. When I saw this on here, Professor, oh, man, I popped big time. Yeah. Great number two spot. Uh, the slingshot suplex was a nice-looking finish. I don't know if it would be considered slow-moving today or what, but you got to remember that you do have to, probably at two different points in this move, you have to deadlift your opponent a little bit to pull it off. You know, they can assist in getting themselves up off the ground and into a vertical position. But after that, you drop them back on the ropes and then take them back up again. So there is at least two points in here where I think you're deadlifting the guy. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. And also, yeah. if the, most of the time, the ropes are very, very stiff. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to, you know, you're trying to work together. Obviously, you're not trying to kill your opponent because you have to work back then, you know, so many days out of the year, you have to hit that person. You don't want to hit their knees across the rope. You don't want to try to hit them across the dick. You got to try to hit them at the proper place, either on the thighs or the, the calves and, and then use the, the slingshot, the momentum, brick oil or momentum yeah. off the ropes to, to send them back over. And it, it's, it's hard to execute, man. And nowadays, of course, you see some of these lighter guys, uh, and it's just the evolution of professional wrestling. But some guys just use things as high spots now. And that's I see people kicking out. At one time, no one ever kicked out of the Northern Lights. I see people doing that. But it's to go back. At one point, a body slam was a finish. I saw someone put that on Twitter. When did a body slam, you know, stop being a finish? And there was a time when, you know, you just didn't take your opponent off the mat. You wrestled, you wrestled. But as the sport evolved... People, where I'm going with this, I have a reason for this, is, is things become like, oh, now they can kick out of this mm -hmm. to a power slam. Oh, now they kicked out of the body slam. Now it's a power slam. Again, it's evolving. But here is, uh, to me, with all, uh, and I don't know if there's anyone else that done it or if you got the idea, but here's the thing about Tully. If not, if he didn't create it, which I, I would say, I would, I think he probably did. I'm not saying no one else done it before him or it wasn't done in Japan or anything. You can fact check that or whatever. But the thing is, just the genius of, we went back to, you know, the territory of him working for his father in that promotion all the way through and having all this experience, but he came up with this great finish. And and I don't know if he came up with it himself or he has to assist with it or whatever, but of course we'll give him credit for the, the move itself. How innovative it was at that time, no one else was doing it. It wasn't just a high spot. It wasn't just something you'd done to get to the next, oh, here, do this, do that, or whatever. No, it meant something. He picked your ass up. He dropped you across that top rope. The recoil sent you back up he picked you up again and then you know right to the suplex and that was it one two three and like i said no one ever anyone else on the card did that maneuver and nor did anyone kick out of it unless it was leading to an angle or someone coming and broke up the pin or what have you but pretty much that is a hell of a finishing move for professional wrestling and that's why that's number two and that's just another fucking reason to hate tully blanchard because they've got you in a fucking slingshot suplex your ass was beat and you wasn't kicking out. Yep. You're, there's no getting up from that, everybody. <laughs> yeah. And then I got... That's take us yeah. number one. And then for the number... Oh, you got something else? Oh, no, no, no. For the okay. number one reason. Okay. <laughs> the number one reason we hate Tully Blanchard, he's fucking tougher than all of us. So he, he's got better clothes, better chicks, better friends, better belts. Hell, his robe was nicer than all of ours. And he was tougher than all of us. What the fuck? How is this fair? How is this okay, Bobby? It's not fair. I fucking quit. <laughs> 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 you make me quit. I was oh. ready to give him my girl at the fucking Olive Garden. You know what are you going to do? You know? Oh. So, <laughs> fuck, yeah, he's tougher than you, me, and anyone listening. By God, that's why we hate Tully Blanchard. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, yeah, I get he He quit the I quit match, but he quit it after several, several moments of having his fucking face gouged with a wooden stake. <laughs> that's right. 
You know, as soon as I see you coming at me with a broken chair leg, I'm like, fuck it, I'm out of here, guys. I, I, that's it for me. I'll take my ugly plaid jacket and go now. <laughs> well, speaking of going, man, I think that's going to about conclude this week as we're approaching our time limit draw with the clock uh, approaching one hour. I think we went to a Broadway on 10 reasons why we hate Tully Blanchard. And with that, I'm Bobby Blaze. Professor, take us out, please. You got it. So, everybody, thank you for listening again. It is our pleasure to have you back, but it is your pleasure to listen to me, Jeremy the Professor Vilmer, and the star of the show, Bobby Blaze. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. You can follow the show on Twitter at Bell to Bell Blaze. You can also follow Bobby on Twitter at BobbyBlaze744 and Jeremy on Twitter at at the Geekish Cast. To purchase one of Bobby's books, you can visit tinyurl.com slash blazebook1 to purchase Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boots, Will Travel. And you can visit tinyurl.com slash blazebook2 to get I Kicked Out on 2, The Education of a Wrestler. To donate to the show's podcast hosting fees, you can visit gofundme.com slash bell-to-bell podcast hosting fees. Be sure to include a hyphen in every word in Bell to Bell podcast hosting fees. If you follow and listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. Be sure to share the show with any wrestling fan you may know and get on the Facebook page where you can keep up with Bell to Bell fans just like you. Again, thanks for listening to the program and look for the show again next time.